Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that excellent panel uh, at the luncheon. And you're going to get another um, dose of this wonderful Michelle Miller as part of this. But um, I'm Luann Glazer. I'm the manager of National Programs and Initiatives at FMCS. Uh, we, you know, just as it says, national programs and initiatives in this conference has been sort of my big portfolio for the last eight months, so I've lived and breathed this. And I'm honored to have this opportunity uh, to moderate what I think <clears throat> um, you know, is going to be a really interesting panel. And when we were developing the program content for the conference, we wanted to be really thoughtful in ensuring that we address the full range of topics impacting the future at work for parties in the collective bargaining community. So during these three days, you're going to have access to programs covering topics from traditional uh, mainstay elements of negotiation, pay and benefits, and problem solving to vast disruptions of possibly our comfort zones. And I think this one, um, is you know, the vastly ever-increasing uh, and impactful digital technologies and social media and artificial intelligence. So this topic uh, represents what some things uh, at times can be uncomfortable foray into the threatening and unknown. Um, but it's clearly an important topic, I think, for everybody uh, in the collective bargaining world to start this conversation uh, in, as labor management and, quite frankly, neutrals. So as a neutral, I have a great interest in this part of the future at work. So our hope is that we can take and learn and develop some joint solutions from this that will enable us to harness the power uh, and also mitigate the dangers of this type of viral communication as it impacts bargaining, uh, organizational reputations, employee engagement, and dispute resolution. So um, these are... Our, is, this is our expert panel. I'm going to go quickly and introduce. Their bios are on the app and also on the web. They are very distinguished and very knowledgeable. Um, but whether you disagree or, what, or, or agree with what they have to say, uh, their experiences and knowledge uh, in these areas can be of significant value to all of us in the future at work. Um, the first panelist here to my right uh, is Roger King. Roger King is the Senior Labor and Employment Counsel for HR Policy Association. Uh, with a career spanning more than 40 years, Roger has testified before both the U.S. Senate and House Labor Committees, is a fellow of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers, and serves on the Advocacy Committee of the American Society for Healthcare Human Resource Association, and on the Executive Committee of the Ohio State Bar Association Labor and Employment Law Section Council. He's a nationally recognized author and speaker on employment matters and has represented employers regarding labor and employment issues both before administrative agencies and in federal and state courts. Uh, to his right is Michelle Miller. You all met her at the luncheon, uh, co-founder of coworker.org, a digital platform that uh, matches campaigning tools with organizing media and legal support to help people change their working condition. Michelle's early work uh, developing coworker was supported by a 2012 practitioner fellowship at Georgetown University's Calumet's Cal. Man Kalmanovitz? Yes. Kalmanovitz, there we go. Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor, and she is a 2014 Echoing Green uh, Global Fellow. Before founding coworker.org, uh, co founding, Michelle spent a decade at SEIU, uh, where she pioneered creative projects and advanced union campaigns. And Michelle's prominence as a thought leader in this area uh, earned her the honor of being the moderator for President Obama's. Uh, town Hall on Worker Voice uh, just last year. Um, to her right is Lowell Peterson. Um, if you've been following the world of collective bargaining, uh, you'll see um, some very prominent companies like Huffington Post and Gawker and other digital media companies uh, are, are getting into the collective bargaining uh, realm. And Lowell Peterson is at the helm of those negotiations for the Writers Guild of America East. Um, he's been the executive director since 2008. His digital media initiatives have included seminars and other events to explore financial, technological, and artistic dynamics of new media, a digital media training program, and organizing creators in that sector. Uh, beside him is Sadat Shami. Uh, he leads the Center for Engagement and Social Analytics at IBM Corporate Headquarters in Armonk, New York. Uh, those of you that were in the Young Worker panel this morning, um, Sadat is actually a boss's boss, right? Um, his current interests are at the intersection of organizational science and social media 
analytics. His team of researchers and practitioners focus on delivering business insights by pushing the boundaries of the inferences that can be drawn by combining large-scale social media data with enterprise data. More recently, he has led several advanced analytic projects in the employee engagement and social space, showing linkage with various outcomes of interest to IBM. So with that, um, I welcome these wonderful panelists. And um, I want to jump right into it. What we're going to do is we're going to have, it's sort of in two parts here. Uh, they're, they're split up deliberately because we have two big topics. One is going to be uh, the use of social media in the bargaining environment. And the other is the sort of uh, social media campaigns and the social media impact from the outside to collective bargaining. So um, we're going to start uh, with the phenomenon of using social media as an integrated element or supplement to bargaining. Um, uh, Roger is going to, um, to talk about some of the, the concerns and the sort of legal parameters. Um, but for Lowell, Lowell's, gonna, Lowell's in the thick of it. Lowell is actually uh, utilizing or involved in collective bargaining that utilizes social media applications as sort of an adjunct to the bargaining process. So can you tell us, um, your pers from your perspective, um, what, what type of engagement um, experience this engagement is where social media and collective bargaining converge? Well, uh, uh, to put a, a little more detail on it, the Writers Guild has recently, well, we're an organizing union. We organize writers and other content creators across the media space. You know, we represent TV and movie writers, news writers, uh, nonfiction producers, and so forth. And most recently, we've organized five so-called digital native uh, enterprises, Gawker, uh, which just sold yesterday to Univision, uh, Huffington Post, uh, Think Progress, Salon.com, and, and Vice's digital operations. Now, these are uh, right at the center of the use of social media. And, and we used uh, electronic communications more broadly uh, in the organizing process. Uh, when we went to Gawker, Nick Denton said, sure, I'll, I'll agree to recognize you, but you have to uh, agree to have your entire organizing process be open and online. So people were tweeting whether they were pro-union or not. We had an online forum. We had a vote online. Um, we've, we've, uh, all of our members are at these places are active social media users. So throughout the organizing campaigns, they used them. And when we got into the bargaining process, it didn't stop. You know, it, they didn't suddenly put their phones away. They didn't close their laptops. Uh, you know, we've been active in the digital, digital space for a long time. We have this, as you mentioned in the introduction, we had a digital media education program where we taught people digital skills, use of social media to promote your stories, to interact. In the course of that, we learned that, you know, digital media are, are very disruptive and very uh, interactive, and these employees love that. Um, it's, uh, it's not a command control medium. It's very much a lean in and not a lean back medium. And when we got into bargaining, uh, I guess I should say we weren't surprised, but we were a little bit surprised at how, some of how that worked out. You know, I remember our first bargaining committee session at one of these shops. Everybody was clacking away on their computers, and I thought they were just, you know, working on their stories. Actually, our bargaining committee deliberations were being live slacked to the entire workforce. <laughs> so I had to tell people, you know, maybe you can do a summary afterwards. <laughs> um, but, you know, this, that's what employees in this workforce demand. That level of transparency and engagement is really central to it. And that's where social media exists. It does present challenges, but, you know, it is where this workforce lives. It's the way people are accustomed to organizing, it's the way they're accustomed to working, and it doesn't stop when we enter negotiations. So we've, we've encountered it in, at all five of these sites and, uh, and uh, you know, learn to go with it. I remember doing one of these things, uh, uh, being at a conference a few years ago where it was actually a union person said, you know, you're, you're gonna put up your website, you're gonna do your social media stuff, and you gotta control your message. You gotta make sure you're in charge of what people say. And I raised my hand and I said, well, if that's what you want, don't do it. In a bargaining situation, you do wanna control your message, but really, I think as negotiators, we have to recognize that that becomes less and less possible as more and more people are engaging with one another in social media. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you can ask your bargaining committee people not to do what our bargaining committee did. You know, <laughs> live tweet 
confidential internal deliberations, but, but it has really opened up the bargaining process in a way that the bargaining unit employees demand, but that pose challenges for us as negotiators. Thank you. So, so Roger, um, what have you experienced? Uh, you represent uh, your employer side clients. I, I know that you've encountered, we've had these conversations. Um, what do you see as the major implications for traditional bargaining um, as we've come to know it? You know, labor management and neutrals in the sort of traditional realm. I'll answer your question. But first, I want to congratulate you and Allison for what a great conference mm -hmm. you put together. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Very impressive, very impressive. Thank you. So, so I'm listening to Lowell talk and I'm thinking about the 30, 40 years I've bargained contracts. And I think about my union colleagues and my management side colleagues and I'm thinking, what if all that was online? <laughs> how, how, how would that have played out? Could we have gotten a deal? Um, how do we caucus? Uh, some of the theatrical moments and some of the less, um, how should we put it, Luann? Uh, less democratic type of processes <laughs> that occur j just to get a deal. Right. Uh, it seems to me uh, those are very real things that we need to talk about. So a as we think about interactive bargaining, uh, electronic town hall bargaining, um, online bargaining, why, why do we need Lowell even to be in a room together, right? Mm. Uh, I think about all those things and I think about what's happened to me, I think about my union colleagues, how would they have handled it? How would negotiations uh, gone about? So we're gonna get into that, but I thought it would be helpful before we get into some of those questions just to talk about the National Labor Relations Act. I know it's a law that many people think uh, has outlived its usefulness. I'm not sure about that. Um, but let's just go through some of the basics. I'm going to go through this very quickly. This is all online, I think, right, Lou? Correct, and it's also on your app, so it's available on the web and on the app. So I think this is a good starting point because this is really is the bedrock of how we still negotiate mm -hmm. uh, contracts in this country, right? So meet at reasonable times, reasonable intervals, et cetera. Lowell, that may change, right, if we're online or if we're having uh, to have everybody involved, if you will, uh, confer in good faith. Uh, absolutely, but how do we go about doing that electronically? Is there a difference, if you will? Legal requirements, I don't think I need to remind anybody uh, of that in this room. Uh, specific requirements of the parties. I think it's important as we go through these slides quickly, you must remember that the employer, as you know, has a right to bring to the table who it desires as its representative or representatives, as does the union. And neither side can influence unduly or interfere in any fashion who the other side has at the table. If we are in a total electronic space, is that going to change? Uh, how does that LRA requirement play out in this space? Ground rules. Uh, many of us in this room have spent a lot of time setting ground rules, particularly in initial collective bargaining situations. Will those ground rule negotiations now become even more complex as we get online? as we work through these issues? Perhaps yes. Uh, bargaining the contract. Uh, the whole process of how we go about that. Uh, and going through the motions, we've all seen it on both sides, whether it be management or union, sometimes one side or the other is playing for time. You have that renegade employer that's trying to break the union. You have that union that's trying to make life difficult for the employer. We've seen it on both sides. If we are totally transparent, if we're totally online, those types of antics are not going to sit well. And well, I don't know what your experience has been in that area. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Well, first of all, I want to say that I think the prospect of doing negotiations entirely online is a scary one. Uh, you know, there's sort of three levels of abstraction. There's uh, everybody's sitting in the room looking at each other. To me, that's the ideal. Right. For a lot of reasons. For one thing, uh, a lot of what you do when you, when you negotiate is manage relationships mm -hmm. and, as well as communications. And it's really hard to do that if somebody's on the phone or the most abstract when everybody's simply online. Right. It makes it much more difficult, not only in terms of information security and managing the, the process of posturing and so forth, but it's also... Well, you, you mean people posture at the table? <laughs> I'm told. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so I'm told. But... Um, you know, I tell you, it also makes, gives people like us job security because these challenges are just exponentially greater than what we faced before. Because 
I can tell you as a union person, we do face this desire. I mean, Michael Winship, our president, is here. He can tell you he hears from, he hears from members all the time. They want to be engaged, and it's really good. You know, that means that they care. But managing the process when they're not even really in the room is very difficult. Or if, if there are people, some of whom are in the room and some of whom are responding via Slack or Twitter or Facebook mm -hmm. or what have you and influencing the people who are in the room, mm -hmm. we've experienced that too, mm -hmm. it makes our jobs more difficult. And, and I think we have to learn a new set of skills because mm -hmm. you know, maybe some of the tricks we used to play, we can't play anymore. It's entirely possible. I mean, uh, there will always be room for the caucus in the hallway. And that will never go online. Really? But, but it Are will, you sure? Are you sure about I that? I am sure about that. All right. it, it, well, I'm not going to bet a lot of money on it. But right. I think that the, but it's going to be a lot less significant. It will, um, I think that uh, union members, at least, have demanded a lot more. Um, uh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm using this word too often, transparency and engagement. I think it's really uh, the way workers think, the way employees think, certainly the way media employees, who we represent, mm -hmm. think. That's how they live. That's how they breathe. And frankly, once you open it up that way, you open it up to the press. If a writer at Gawker tweets something, Politico's got it five minutes later. We've had that happen, too. Um, but uh, it, it does make the scope of more traditional handshake, have a cup of coffee after work kind of bargaining more narrow and more limited, and it makes our jobs more challenging in terms of building consensus in our respective rooms. I have to wrangle my committee as much as you have to wrangle your committee. Absolutely. And sometimes that just uh, is that much more difficult if you, not everybody's sitting there in the room with you. So, so what about DFR? That's really not in my slides, but the duty of fair representation obligations mm -hmm. on the union movement, and you may have seen this online also. Um, now that you have more people involved, more, more of the bargaining unit, from all different perspectives. Does that give you some pause? Well, uh, there, it does certainly raise confidentiality issues. It does uh, make it more tricky to balance the sometimes contradictory uh, interests uh, in the bargaining unit. Basically, the DFR cases, as I understand them, give the union a fair amount of deference. Yes, absolutely. But I haven't seen any cases since this social media explosion, I, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think, again, it just uh, underscores the importance of listening and balancing and making sure you don't uh, say or do anything stupid, because you can't hide it anymore. It's all right there. It's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be online, it's gonna be in the courtroom if uh, we go to litigation. Yep. Let me just finish the NLRA background quickly. Um, we've talked about the ability of both labor and management to choose unilaterally their representatives uh, that choosing, if you will, of who's at the table, well, it seems to me may be influenced if we're going to be totally transparent, totally online. Uh, as a management person, I may not want to have that out outspoken supervisor from Department X on my team because of what she or he may be saying at the table then is broadcast uh, to whoever is out there, right? Uh, by like token, I think the union may have some concerns in that regard, too. No, we never have anybody like that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care who's on your, uh, your team? We okay. never have any disruptors. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be, I think, an interesting process. So we all know about the mandatory subject issues and maybe the education that has to occur online for the rest of the audience, Lou Ann, will have to be expanded. We may have to take a little more time if we've got a lot of people involved that are not in the room that are neophytes, if you will, in the bargaining process. We use Google Docs to, create, to craft bargaining proposals. If you really? want to pull your hair out, oh, use God. that because you, then it becomes even, forget about the selecting your bargaining representatives, right. just selecting your bargaining proposals becomes that much more complicated. So yeah, it's a challenge. So I want to skip to the last slide. This is pretty much Hornbook LRA law. Those in the room, and there are many in the room that negotiate continuously. If I, as a management person, say I want to bring in a court reporter or a stenographer and record everything or take down everything that's said at the bargaining table, Lowell, as the union representative, can say, King, no way, I object. And if I proceed unilaterally, that's a violation of the act, right? That's pretty much Hornbeck law. So if we get in negotiations with the guild, whatever, and you say to me, 
Uh, I want all of our members to be able to participate. And I say, no way, we're not going to go that route. It's too disruptive. I think I still have a right to do that. But is the law going to change in this area? Are, are we going to see more of that? And for mediators, Lou Anne, what's this mean? The challenges for the neutrals, I think, have to be very significant. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely something that our um, agency, because of the sort of confidentiality uh, issues, we've been looking at for years. Uh, and we have as many questions uh, and concerns, I think, as the parties do uh, in this. So did, were there more that... No, no, I, I think that's the bedrock. I think people in this audience are sophisticated enough. I just mm -hmm. wanted to get that out. That's where the law seems to sit at the moment. Is it equipped to handle where we're going in the future? Yeah, and what I, what I think we're, we're all seeing is that the law is much slower than the pace of change with regard to how digital media and digital everything and online everything um, is happening. But I just want to throw one more question um, to both you and um, Lowell. Uh, from your experiences, and both of you have had experiences where you've encountered this sort of uh, social media engagement, um, what words of caution would you give um, to those who may, in the future at work, encounter uh, this unwittingly or, in, you know, c consensually, the sort of social media-engaged bargaining. What words of caution would you have for them and advice? Well, I mean, you have to be aware of it. You have to be aware that increasingly the members of the union uh, want that level of engagement, but there are limits that Ground rules, I think, you have to set at the beginning of the process. I mean, we, I, I've, I've made the pitch for that so many members now uh, crave this online community. I mean, most of our members are freelancers. They work in separate locations. So it's not a, 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 a brand new experience for us. But um, I don't have a problem setting a ground rule that when you're in the bargaining room, don't tweet. <laughs> you know, what we say here, we say here. Uh, it can't be complete anarchy because you just can't manage the process. You can't uh, have candid conversations. You might reveal things to the bargaining unit members that you don't, that you would regret later, confidential information about some particular employee situation. And um, I have to say, people have responded well. Um, uh, but at the same time you set those restrictive guidelines, you have to recognize that when you're finished with the bargaining, that means you have to think about a more open communicative process afterwards. Um, it's, not, um, it's not a bad thing for mobilizing members to have that kind of open communication. So, uh, but you have to think about it. And go back to my anecdote about the union guy saying you have to control your message. You, you're not going to be able to control your message in this interactive digital environment. Um, it's going to be a lot more freewheeling. And it's just a challenge we're all going to face. Roger. I agree. Um, <clears throat> what about circumventing the union representative. I think that's a concern. I mean, that's Hornbook right. law. Obviously, the employer cannot go around the union to go directly to the membership. But as we open up uh, the negotiation process, online or otherwise, there are at least potential uh, right. options for an employer to go that route. Uh, by like token, I don't want every supervisor. I don't want every executive. I don't want the entire management team in the room while we're negotiating for reasons that you don't want the entire bargaining unit, perhaps. We, we have to be able to have representatives that can bargain, that can go back and forth on issues. Now, there's got to be give and take. I'm concerned about whether that give and take process is going to be harmed uh, if we go so virtual, if you will. I, I'm concerned about uh, the mediation process. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to have the ability to have a private hallway conference uh, with the mediator and then also with my union colleague. And when we get down to the 12th hour, uh, that's when we're going to get the deal done, probably. Right. But if we can't do that, and if we've got the entire body involved, both management and union side, I'm not sure how we get, get there from here. Uh, and it seems to me the potential for uh, dissident groups within the union movement, uh, and you have them, and unreasonable people on the management side, and we have them, uh, starting to control the process, just like our political system, where we have people on the far left or far right dictating our choices in this country, and no one's willing to compromise. I don't see how we get uh, a stable relationship established. So 
Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to get more people involved, uh, both management and union side, but there have to be limits. I, I agree. Yes. I, I think the, it, does, it is incumbent on us as union reps to make sure, you know, when you get to the end and it's ratification time, to your point, right. and you haven't brought your troops along with you through the, some sort of communicative process, that is shame on you as a union rep. So it's a challenge that has simply been heightened by this. Yeah, just one other point. I'm not sure how, as a management rep uh, at the table, chief spokesman or otherwise, I'm going to be able to control, particularly with people you represent, what they are doing uh, at the table. I, I don't know how I monitor that. Um, I do know that I've been telling uh, management people that bargain a lot, you better get your communication strategy in order. I'm not telling them to circumvent the union by any means. But you're going to have to be able to communicate, including some electronic communication with the union membership. Now, that's a sensitive subject. I know in, in many negotiations, some union uh, people would say, don't you dare speak to the membership while we're negotiating. That's our responsibility. Well, I'm not so sure. The lines, I think, are going to be blurred. So we're going to, we're going to have people going their own way, whether you want to control them or I want to control them. I think that's going to be a, a big, challenge. big challenge. A big challenge. Well, suffice it to say, as a mediator myself, I will still enforce those if we need to have a sidebar. Well, we won't be tweeting. So FMCS is not going to be tweeting those sidebars. Confidentiality? Can that's we, right. All right. All absolutely. Right. Absolutely guaranteed. All right, let me turn this thing off. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so turning to um, what is an even more provocative topic, um, the way employees engage with each other um, and their employers through social media and how workers are using these means as a mechanism for dispute resolution and how that presents some broad challenges, but perhaps some opportunities uh, for unions and employers. And I'm going to start with you, Michelle. Um, uh, as the uh, founder, uh, co-founder of coworker.org, what do you think is the fundamental thrust of this forum you've created? And what are the, some of the successes and some of the challenges you've observed in administrating this dispute resolution and engagement tool? Thank you, Lou Ann. Um, first, I just want to say that I've been totally riveted by this back and forth between the two of you um, <laughs> and am really humbled by the sets of questions that everybody's wrestling with, um, but also the willingness to really engage with them and sort of not shut down, um, which I think is, shows a lot of growth for all of us, myself included, over the past five to ten years as we've, as we've started to think about these questions. So um, that's been, this has been great to listen in. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background on why coworker.org got started, just in case you didn't hear it like five minutes ago when I said <laughs> it before. Um, and then talk a little bit about what we've learned and the questions we were asking, and then sort of tell a story um, about something that we've just observed. So coworker.org was founded three years ago by myself and Jess Kutch um, after we left SEIU, and we really... Um, had been intrigued by the ways in which workers were finding one another on social media um, and were trying to wrestle with problems at their work sites. Um, and we were impressed at the leadership that people were showing and this willingness to really dig in on these tough questions. Um, and an important thing that we observed um, among these conversations was that these were workers who really cared about the places they worked. You don't go online on Reddit or Facebook and engage in hours long back and forth about something really minuscule going on at work if you don't care about it. If you're really angry and you just want to throw bombs, you say a couple things and then you roll out. And so we really saw this as a moment where people were taking a new kind of leadership and it was a leadership that was happening um, outside of a traditional union organizing campaign. but deserved to be supported um, and to start to think about how we could tap into that and make that into something. Um, so we launched in 2013 as um, a petitioning platform because what we had been seeing workers learn, use the most was user-generated petitions like change.org to really um, what the process would be that they would have these conversations on Facebook or Reddit or sometimes they would write letters to Gawker um, or <laughs> other places um, and uh, start to have this conversation and then really want to do something about it together and that the digital space actually gave them an opportunity to do that no matter where they were working. So if you were a Starbucks barista and you only ever saw six people that worked there, you had suddenly had access to six people in a thousand different places um, um, using the internet, and you could you could discuss things, um, and so 
you know, we really wanted to explore what were the, the sets of things that people would need, both from a technology standpoint and from a staff support and expertise standpoint, which I think is really, as I was listening to you to discuss this sort of moving into the virtual space of bargaining, I kept thinking about how it is actually true that once people start going down this road, they really value the expertise right. that intermediaries can bring into the space. They're not going to go back, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And, they're, and they're going to you know, want people who have experience in this to help them along and that we can actually figure out the roles that all of us can play in, in helping people um, figure that out. So um, over the past three years, workers have run campaigns um, at a number of employers. They've built what we call employee networks, um, which are groups of workers uh, that have a shared employer um, who have joined a number of campaigns to change important things in their workplaces. Um, and so those are the networks that we actually see as the bargaining uh, entities going forward. Um, and our uh, largest networks are, um, we have 12% uh, of Starbucks global workforce, we have about 5,000 Uber drivers, um, we have 10,000 Publix grocery store workers, um, we have um, eight, like 18,000 US Airways American Airlines employees who are also members of a union. Um, we, have, we have these large networks that have formed around issues like um, dress code policies at Starbucks um, and scheduling at Starbucks, um, uh, workers at a southern restaurant chain called Tupelo Honey who raised wages for support staff. Um, workers at REI just two weeks ago raised wages in seven different locations. We currently have um, uh, a campaign by WeWork employees to end the use of arbitration clauses in their agreements. There's a wide variety of, of campaigns that workers have been running and winning. Um, and through the process of running and winning these campaigns, they're starting to build a capacity around asserting a thing that they want, bringing people together to start to talk about the ways in which they could solve the problem, um, and um, putting that sort of um, combined public and private pressure on their employers to actually come and discuss those issues with them. Um, and about a year and a half ago, I came uh, to FMCS and I presented this really excited utopian story about how workers were doing all of this great stuff online and was tremendously humbled, I have to say, by um, one of the folks in the room saying, but in negotiation, our job is to reduce the amount of things that we're arguing about and to really come to some sort of an agreement where people can solve the problem. And opening up the megaphone of social media makes that almost impossible. Um, and you know, how do you respond to that? And I, to be perfectly honest, my response was like, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> I just, uh, um, I, I really felt that that was such an important question, an important thing to wrestle with, which is why I've really been interested in continuing the conversation with folks in this room and other people who can help us figure that out. Um, and we, you know, for the past three years, have really just been in a growth phase where we've been supporting these worker-led campaigns that are growing these networks, but have not. Got, had not gotten to a place of negotiation until about two months ago. And so I'll close on that story, um, which is, uh, so we have this Starbucks network. They've run about 45 campaigns on a variety of issues. They've won changes around their dress code. They now can have tattoos and dyed hair. Um, but they've also really seen some substantive changes around scheduling practices um, and policies on hours. And um, a couple months ago, uh, they started to experience labor shortages at all of the stores. And baristas had networks through Facebook and through our platform and were starting to share these stories and data points about what they were all seeing at these different locations and were able to see that from their perspective, this was um, a company-wide issue. And so um, a barista named Jamie Prater started a campaign around labor shortages and really framed it to the company as you're killing morale. Um, that was basically the phrasing that he used. Um, and we need to get the stores back up to staffing levels. He's been an employee for six years. He loves Starbucks and he really wants to see them recapture their former days of glory. Um, very quickly, about, I, I think we have about 11,000 baristas that have joined that campaign um, in about three weeks. Um, and conversations started both through our platform and through emails to Jamie um, and on Facebook about the situation with the labor shortages. And Jamie 
actually got Howard Schultz on the phone, and then uh, later, who's the president of Starbucks, and later um, Howard connected him to HR and um, the sort of folks in corporate to talk about what the labor shortage problem was. And Jamie's response to this was to go back to those networks um, that had formed on Facebook and start asking them, what should I talk about? What are the things that are bothering us? What are the things that we think can change? What are the things that can improve? And basically collaboratively built a document with seven different areas for improvement that was put together by these groups of workers, both um, through Facebook, through private messages, through emails, through comments on the site. And it was a really interesting generative process. People were really committed to identifying um, problems that both um, impacted workers, but also impacted the ability of Starbucks to run a good business and were impacting customers. They even had a section on shareholders in the, in the final document. I mean, they were really thinking holistically about the impact on the business um, that the labor shortages uh, was, were creating. And I was, I was, we were all actually, I mean, again, I'm going to use the word humbled, humbled by the energy that people brought into the conversation and the positivity um, around actually fixing the issues. And Starbucks has responded so far to say that they are looking into the issues. Um, and it's going to be an ongoing process. But I think that this is one of the first signs of, of the ways in which in a non-traditional context, a worker has been able to engage people um, through the platform. And also, I'll say, um, everybody, because they were bought in and they were bought into Jamie's leadership, people were OK with the fact that he was having a one-on-one -on -one conversation based on the feedback that he was getting from them. And I think that, that what that speaks to is when we're talking about being able to have sidebars or being able to have like these sort of one-offs, that if you're building trust along the way, people are really smart and they understand that that is just sometimes necessary. Um, and so, you know, I would say that uh, it's, it's a hairy world, but there's a lot of potential for us to do some pretty amazing things. So, so if I may. I, I see Roger has a question. So, you know, I'm th Michelle, I'm listening. Great presentation. I should have put on the screen in my slides the definition of a labor organization mm -hmm. under the National Labor Relations Act. I'm listening to what you are saying. We've got interactivity going on. You represent workers in one sense, right? Well, so not really. No, well, I'm not we so don't. Sure. We don't negotiate at all on behalf of workers. Well, but you, but you went to the employer and you. you we did made... not. Jamie Prater went. Ah, all I, right. It's all very right. important that we do not represent. We do not so go you, to employers. You don't want to become a labor organization. No, we do not want to become a. All we are right. a platform that is really focused on the leadership of the workers. So we never have any interaction. That is a very important distinction well, for us. as a former labor leader, I'm sure you're sensitive to that. Yes. But, but I'm listening to this, <laughs> and I'm thinking, maybe not your organization, mm -hmm. but others, collective action may be supplanting collective bargaining to a certain extent, mm -hmm. and or we have new electronic unions being formed, mm -hmm. and what's their role with the traditional union? Mm -hmm. I mean, all very interesting and difficult questions, That's I think. That's a great question. It is. I there is the small matter of being able to strike, which is hard yeah. to do online. Yeah. We had strike strength at all five of these shops. So wait, 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 that wait. makes a difference, you know, withholding yeah, sure. labor is... Withholding, uh, withholding mm -hmm. services, that's mm -hmm. true. It's, it's, it's a tactic I still very much favor. <laughs> not when we do make progress at the bargaining table or anything. But. <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> but I hope you also I'm favor <laughs> collaborative outcomes. Absolutely. Right? Right. I'm into yeah. IBB. All right. Right. Okay. But you do call FMCS first before you right. strike. Oh, yeah. 30 days. Absolutely. Days. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. So now turning to um, um, Sadat. Uh, if you could pass the... Uh, the clicker down for, oh, sure. there we go. So um, Sadat, um, IBM has been uh, for some time looking at uh, these external and internal social media and how it impacts worker dispute resolution, organizational representation, collective bargaining outcomes, and employee engagement. Um, can you kind of bring us up to speed on what IBM has been doing? Uh, and I, I know I've seen um, actually your boss, Alan King, uh, do a similar presentation, some really fascinating um, data work that you're doing. And thank you, Luann, and um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank, thank you for inviting me. So um, at IBM, I just want to talk a little bit about my responsibility, the kind of a background in terms of the content I'll be kind of um, presenting today. So I have overall responsibility for employee engagement, um, measurement, analytics, reporting, and most importantly, the actions to, to improve engagement, but also at the same time, um, what we call IBM employee social media analytics. IBM being a tech company, we have a significant social media footprint, both internally within 
our company, uh, we have an internal social media platform called IBM Connections that provides um, communities, online communities, forums, status updates, blogs. Um, uh, it's basically a collaboration platform for employees to do work, but at the same time, they can share these messages between them. And um, we, and I'll show this <laughs> in my presentation, kind of how we are able to, to analyze that content in a privacy-aware manner and enable employee voice. Um, so, and also externally, it's a little bit more difficult to identify who IBMers are, and in fact, that's not our purpose, but we listen for content around IBM and um, how that may potentially affect our employment brand. Um, all of this work, um, the main motivation is that talent is our most critical asset. That is our um, competitive differentiator, and we need to attract and retain um, the, the top talent in order to, to stay in business. So increasingly, um, as many of you know, um, social media is just playing a, a big role in terms of um, how communication happens. So we know that um, on social media platforms, uh, communication spreads very quickly, especially negative uh, comments. So there needs to be ways to kind of um, be able to get ahead of that. Um, I don't know if people can actually see in the back, but um, the, the headline over here, the Times of India, Bloodbath Begins at IBM India, was kind of our um, social media horror story. We don't have, fortunately, that many, but um, this was coming out of one manager in India not handling a separation mm. properly. So there were, um, you know, within an, the employee that was affected tweeted about this within an hour, there were you know, about, uh, let's say, 100 or so retweets. Within 24 hours, this got 25,000 retweets. So you can imagine the amplification factor. And then ultimately made the, the Times of India, which is the largest um, English language news paper in, in India. And it, it also um, was communicated by the unions. So uh, to be able to kind of get ahead of this, and I'll show some of the tools that we use since um, you know, kind of going through this experience, our lessons learned, uh, to be able to um, you know, be more aware of what our employees, former employees, um, potential employees uh, are saying. And that's the, another point, that uh, we need to pay attention to this kind of complete employee life cycle, if you will. Um, our employment brand is dictated by certainly our current and for, former employees about what they say. Um, externally, there's all these platforms that are available, social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, but also specific sites like Glassdoor. There's also um, apps right now, that, uh, like um, Comparably or Memo, where they invite people um, from all companies to talk anonymously about their employer. So even if you are not providing a platform for employees to talk about the work experience, there are other opportunities for them to do so. So just kind of ignoring that won't help. Um, we also see that increasingly um, the, the relationships that employees form through these types of social networks, um, their, their peers and their friends um, that um, get um, created through like, working across geographic boundaries. You know, talking about IBM, you know, we operate in um, many countries. So you do have to work with these other people across the globe. So, so those relationships actually affect um, people a, a lot more than their immediate manager. Um, so, so then it's also very important to, to understand those communications and relationships. So at IBM, we have this kind of three component circular model about how we um, enable employee voice while respecting employee privacy to get an understanding of employee engagement. And you know, uh, for many of you, um, this is, you know, again, preaching to the choir, but we know that employee engagement leads to a lot of positive outcomes, um, both in terms of the, the business outcomes, business results, but also operational outcomes like you know, um, longer retention, going the extra mile, um, those types of, of outcomes. So the first um, component that we have is empowering people. Um, so we do have a variety of channels available to our employee population to give us feedback 
Um, our senior leaders write blogs about strategy, about uh, the direction the company is doing, and they invite employees to, to respond to them. Um, so part of it is, again, the culture at IBM, and culture is very important. I don't think you know, we're completely 100% there in terms of creating this culture of feedback, um, but we are striving towards that. And you know, different companies will vary along that continuum of creating that culture. Um, then the second component is, you know, this is like IBM around 400,000 employees. This generates a lot of data, a lot of unstructured data. Mm -hmm. So th there needs to be tools to be able to analyze that um, to, especially in my role, to bring it uh, to the attention of, of the business leaders that are making decisions that, employ that affect employees. The, the third component is actually the, the most important component, which is this culture of trust. So all of the other things won't be possible if there isn't any trust between the, the employees and the organization, you know, the union or the organization. Um, so again, this is not an overnight <laughs> thing that will happen. It's a journey. But creating that culture of trust is paramount um, because otherwise you will just have garbage in and then garbage out. You know, people will just say what you want them to say, mm -hmm. that type of a thing. So um, it's about creating this culture where um, not only positive feedback, uh, but also constructive feedback is encouraged because we all know there's always room for improvement. So some of the tools that we use um, to, to analyze um, employee feedback and employee voice, I'll kind of run through in, in the next few slides. Um, this is a screenshot of what we call social pulse. And this is for our internal social media platform. Um, as you can see here, it's not really um, it's kind of very high level trends about what our employees are talking about. And then we can segment this by, by geography or business um, unit or other types of demographics. But there is no identity information. We don't necessarily um, care <laughs> what a specific uh, employee is saying. Like if Michelle was an IBMer, we don't really care what Michelle specifically is saying. But if enough Michelles are saying the same thing, mm -hmm. that is of importance to us. And that's how we take it to to our leadership. Um, case in point, um, there was this petition. Um, and yes, we do have petitions um, on our social media platform as well. Um, so a rank and file IBMer posted a petition about why it's in the best interest of IBM to reimburse ride sharing services like Uber and Lyft um, for a variety of reasons, primarily with experiences in other, comp in other countries about safety and insurance. Mm -hmm. um, IBM had a policy of not to reimburse these types of services. But this employee went point by point about why it's in the best interest of the company, why it's in the best interest of the employees. And it was very persuasive. And very quickly, it got a lot of attention and got a lot of likes um, on our platform, a lot of employees posting comments in support of it. So we were able to identify this within nine hours through you know, the tool that I just mentioned, Social Pulse. And then we raised it um, to our CHRO, Diane Gearson. And she got her team together. Um, she um, under, uh, tried to un understand what, you know, how this policy came about, you know, what are the pros and cons. And then within 16 hours of the blog going live, she made the decision to reverse the policy. So less than 24 hours, um, this is happening. Um, so within our social media platform, we get about 65,000 um, public social media posts per week. So the employees that posted um, this petition and supported it were on one hand just amazed that we were able, able to find this uh, among the deluge of content, but also for our CHRO to respond within 24 hours um, was enough for a lot of people just responding. But to reverse the policy was just did wonders for employee engagement. Mm -hmm. So this is a use case um, that we like to mention where you know, sometimes it is this kind of gray area about mm -hmm. listening to employees um, and also kind of being responsive to employees. So I, I f we feel that you know, this is, pr provides that type of a use case where you know, we've, be we've been able to balance not being creepy versus actually <laughs> driving change <laughs> in the company and giving employees voice. So this has continued. There has been other um, uh, petitions uh, posted on our um, connections platform. Um, 
And clearly, we will not always be reversing policy. But again, it just speaks to creating this culture of feedback and culture of trust that we are listening to you. You have power to change policy. Because at the end of the day, you are <laughs> our, our most critical asset. So you know, again, we are on this journey. We're not 100% there yet. But um, we're, we're trying to, to create this culture. Um, so all I've talked about previously was about internal social media. I'm going to switch gears a little and talk about external and what we're doing uh, to understand, let's say, IBM's employment brand and specifically things that are relevant for HR um, that are being talked about in social media. So as you know, externally, um, so for anyone looking at social media, there's just a deluge of content. So um, in order for us to identify content that's relevant for IBM, what we do is uh, we've created this tool. And again, we had the good fortune to work with very talented people at you know, our research labs um, and also analytics people. Um, so they've built this tool uh, working with us to be able to identify content that is kind of like finding needles in a haystack. So in other words, let's just take the example of marriage equality. That is being talked about a lot, right? So it's a topic. But something that is more specific and something that is more actionable is an event. And an event, an example of that is IBM actually um, supporting marriage equality and um, providing those benefits to our same-sex um, employees. Um, so that is something happening at a specific point in time. And through this tool, it allows us to find those types of content um, that can kind of you know, either be very positive or have the potential to, to, you know, to the back to that India example of um, bloodbath, have the potential to, um, to, av to turn into an avalanche of negativity. Um, so this is the tool that we call, um, this is the front page, if you will. It lists, um, and I know this is, you, know, you can't see this in the back, but the slides are available. But it basically lists these um, uh, collections of, of, of content aggregated from traditional media, like news sites and forums, as well as social media like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then uh, an analyst can kind of very quickly go through it and find content that's relevant um, um, and determine whether this is something that should be escalated up the chain to management. So, um, you know, we have this kind of time range, um, the events in order, um, and then we provide some topics uh, around to kind of describe what they are, because again, they're collected from a variety of sources. But more importantly, sometimes there's just, if you notice here, there's like some events that have like two posts or three posts. So this is the idea that you know, somebody um, going on Facebook, just kind of writing about uh, you know, the company, and potentially that could get a lot of traction. So we, again, this is an early warning system, early <coughs> detection, to kind of get ahead of that. So uh, this is the, the last slide. And then um, this kind of just provides a little bit more drill down into the sources. So this particular example shows that the majority of content is coming from Twitter. Um, you know, what is uh, the number of, if, uh, of posts in the event? Um, the, the sentiment of it, and then within um, the interface itself, um, the actual content. Uh, so if it's, on, if it's tweets, you can click on it and go directly to that specific post on Twitter. So uh, this is kind of a cognitive system as well. So you can give feedback whether this is relevant or not. Because again, with social media, with the, the large amount of content, it's not as precise. So that's why we have to rely on these algorithms to, um, to uh, give us a sense, a clue of whether this is worth escalating further up. So, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to uh, ask a question of uh, Michelle and Sadat. This morning we had a panel on what younger workers want, and it intrigues me, the whole idea of generational diversity. Um, are there distinctions and differences in how the different generations of workers engage in this social, social media system and dispute resolution and engagement? Um, so I will say that uh, for the most part, the actual discussions are pretty intergenerational. 
but the folks that are so we have people who create campaigns and then we have people who join and participate in campaigns. Our campaign creators tend to skew younger. Um, and then the folks that are engaged in the back and forth in the discussion are sort of all over the board. Um, general, well, I will say that uh, in our Starbucks network, because it's the largest, it's the one that I talk about most frequently, um, it is generally longer term employees who are the most engaged and I think that that really stems from, it's a signal of commitment to the company um, the, that you're going to be the one that's going to be talking the most about how to improve the company. Um, and so I, what we're seeing is that there is um, some intergenerational discussion and that uh, what that actually serves, I think it tampers down maybe more of the reactionary language um, because it, there are folks that are engaging um, who have some institutional memory and so can point to the way things were three years ago or five years ago or ten years ago because they had direct experience with it and so it sort of um, changes the, um, the, the tenor of the conversation. Um, and they, they um, uh, are the leader of the, Jamie, the leader of the, the labor shortages campaign has been with the company, like I said, for like six years. He's in his 40s. Um, and um, the, a lot of the media committee, about a 25 barista media committee has formed around doing the talking to the press. They actually tend to be younger. Um, and I, I, it'll be interesting to see how this develops in, in some of our other networks. Yeah, so I'll actually present something that may feel counterintuitive. Um, so I can speak to our internal social media platform mm -hmm. where our CEO you know, posts um, you know, the strategy, what we're doing, the, the, the way forward. And what we see is that our more, let's say, senior people, not the, the millennial necess mm -hmm. millennials necessarily, but more of the senior people um, are posting more, they're commenting more. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea that um, you know, millennials, yes, they are more comfortable with technology, but it, it also may just be because we're a technology company ourselves. Um, we don't see any difference between, uh, there's no difference between the generations, there's no difference between like age, if you will. Uh, in fact, sometimes more of the posts come from people who are senior, let's say. Uh -huh. so, um, that may seem counterintuitive, but that is what the data tells us. And my job is uh, to analyze the data and to present it. So, so that's kind of the perspective that, that we have, at least for our company. It may be different in other companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I want to throw um, a couple of questions to all four of you, sort of a, an umbrella question. And um, I heard uh, Sadat talk about the idea of trust. Uh, it is a key element. I mean, this conference is about you know, labor management, partnerships, and working together. Um, and it's a key element for that. So what, in light of all of this digital social media engagement, what do you think are the most critical actions that labor management should take to promote high levels of trust as we move forward in the, the digital age? Roger, would you like to start? C certainly, listen. Uh, it, it seems to me as I think about this, subject that it's going to keep both labor and management much more honest right if you are totally transparent if if management's playing games whether it be at the bargaining table or away from the table dilatory bargaining uh, surface bargaining what have you and that's out there for everybody to see let alone it's going to be much easier to present a successful unfair labor practice charge because the evidence will be available electronically uh, by like token, if, if, if the union is playing games, is being uh, difficult unnecessarily at the table because of whatever their objective may be, that's going to be out there for everybody to see. And employees may say, I don't want that. I don't need that. Your institutional objectives for the union movement may not coincide with my uh, individual or collective interests. So I think, it, I think this whole development has the potential to keep both sides more honest and hopefully maybe bring us together, potentially. Okay. Michelle. I, yeah, I, um, I would totally agree with that. And one of the, the first things I think that um, this sort of open platforms and social media makes possible is developing a cyclical communication strategy. So that we start to think differently about the way that um, we talk to one another. We don't think of it as just directive. 
um, but that uh, you can put things out there for questions and that you can engage people over time so that, and build trust with them so that when you are at the bargaining table, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, they trust you enough because they know that you've been engaging with them over time to make decisions that are in the best interest of the, I would say, the network or the, the group of employees or um, management because you've been in a conversation over the past three years um, and n not that you are sort of using it as a notification system uh, when it's time to let people know what you, what you decided, you know? So I think that uh, that has, um, I totally agree that it will help keep people more honest and it does actually create a way for people to um, have data over time about the ways that you have arrived at a decision. Like mm -hmm. it's actually kind of great that there's a digital record when you think about it 10 years hence, of all the different moments in which we were debating different things that people can access instead of it being locked in the memory of a few people um, or inaccessible to the broader community. Yep. So do you think we can avoid maybe grievances and arbitrations because that old he said, she said, three years ago at the table, you said this, no I didn't, yes you did, and off we go into grievance arbitration. Now mm -hmm. we're gonna have a record uh -huh. And it may settle things quicker, perhaps. Oh, it Maybe. makes me think of that book by Dave Eggers, The Circle, where everybody has a yeah. live camera of every event in their life. <laughs> <laughs> sort of scary, yeah. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that, that part, that's a little no, too thanks. much. I mean, I think tra <laughs> transparency makes it more difficult to build trust. But I think the trust is deeper once you've built it because mm -hmm. it's based on um, more sharing. I do, I mean, I do think there is a relationship between tr trust and interests, though. You know, we talk about these things in somewhat abstract terms, but, you know, a, a network of people who are trying to advance the interests of employees has a different kind of trust than a network of, you know, employer representatives. And I, th I think that, so there's two different kinds of trust. I mean, building trust sort of within, on, on the worker advocacy side right. is one kind of trust. Building trust across the bridge totally, is, a, is a different kind of trust. Totally different. Both yeah. important, uh, but the challenges that social media present to each other, I think, are different. You know, I mean, when, when our members engage with us, it's like, well, we're, we're bound, you know, we, we got your back. That's what we do. Um, and when we engage with management, we can't lie to you. We can't pretend. I mean, it, it makes it more difficult for us because right. you know what's really going on. And right. um, so the challenges are different based on whose interest is being served. Yeah. So I would agree with all of the panelists. Um, listening is just so important. What I would add is that, that what will help with this creating a culture of trust are actions as well. So, um, you know, based on the feedback that um, presumably will come from listening, uh, the, the organization needs to act. So, case in point, I can give some IBM specific examples. Employees have given us feedback about our performance management system and how um, it's just not working. So, we changed it. So, you know, that's a one to one direct correlation. You spoke. You, uh, we listened and we acted. Another example is um, you know, employees really value um, learning opportunities. Uh, they, they cite that as one of the drivers for, for employee engagement. So we have created um, a kind of a personalized learning platform for our employee population, um, kind of, again, IBM being a tech company, uh, using artificial intelligence to kind of understand how you learn and personalize the learning uh, for your needs, so that type of a thing. So, so these are examples of how you, know, you spoke, we listened, and then we acted, and that creates this culture of trust um, for that, that, that allows even more um, that circular cycle, that cyclical cycle, if you will, you know, circle, mm -hmm. that um, you know, they will continue to then still you know, provide feedback uh, for improvement, uh, and you know, it continues. <laughs> okay. Did you have another question that you well, wanted you know, to I'm ask? Just, that I'm, just, I'm just listening to this. I'm thinking of the NLRB's recent uh, decision, rather recent, in Purple Communications. That's the case. Where the board held, uh, board majority held, that employees, workers, have a right to utilize the employer's email system for union-related activity. Or it could be any, any type of concerted activity. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be union. So, as we think about this, and, and Will, I'm curious as to your point, uh, the general counsel of the board has expressed an interest in expanding uh, 
those opportunities to go beyond email to virtually any type of employer uh, controlled communication system. Are, are, we, are we going to see more developments in that area? It may be fertile area for organizing activity, I'm not sure. And on top of that, of course, we now have the new NLRB rule that uh, employees, workers can sign uh, authorization cards electronically. So I'm, I'm just curious of, of those developments. Well, well, we do use that. We have yeah. filed petitions that they don't want to be using electronic cards. So it's very useful. This is how people communicate. And I think right. that was right. a lot of what inspired the NLRB's thought process when it made that decision. I mean, this is not, it is employer controlled to the extent that the employer pays for it. And it's yeah. most, it was certainly the initial intent was to foster workplace communications and work related communications. But I think in practice, people use it for all kinds of stuff. And you know, maybe employer Facebook sites, employer other social media sites have similarly been broadened. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if the empl I, I think that's really what's informed it. I think the, f the fact is that the way employees have used these communication devices has sort of moved the board to recognize reality. I mean, people shop online at the desk. I don't care what you say. Right. They do it in my <laughs> shop. I walk past them. I have nice shoes. How you about mean, if you handle you that grievance, NCAA you know? NCAA basketball pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, this is, again, it's, you yeah. know, the reality has intruded into our world. Um, yeah, and, and using these, we do use these things for organizing. We, mm -hmm. we get, you know, just like we used to use the, the employee, the, the company's, you know, uh, employee guide to get people's phone numbers. You know, we use really? that. You did that? <laughs> no. I'm told. <laughs> I'm told. <laughs> Someone said this to me once. So it's, it's all useful. Um, and uh, presumably you guys are. Well, I, I, I'll tell you, after Purple Communication and listening to Dick Griffin, the general counsel of the, of the board, so that, I mean, you have these internal electronic communication systems with your associates, with your employees, which I think is great. Uh, but I think every employer needs to be on notice that those avenues for communication are now going to be analogized to the old water cooler situation, mm -hmm. albeit online, and be made available for the employee, maybe not necessarily to unionize, but to collective action mm -hmm. dress code, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the employer community has got to be aware that this horizon is going to open up much broader than it has been. And I would say that for employers, it's important to recognize it as a sign of a healthy workplace that your employees feel that they can have these conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I often, I say this every time I talk about Starbucks to the point that I probably sound like a cheerleader for them, but it is a good sign that people feel so free inside Starbucks to actually have these public conversations and inside a lot of these other companies that have workers running campaigns on our platform. It really does mean that they feel some sense of freedom and not such fear of retaliation and oppression by their man and oppression by their managers that they wouldn't even take the chance to talk online. And we know the difference because we internally see it when workers at other companies put up a petition and then two days later write us a hasty email that says, please take that thing down right now. That's a sign that that's not a company where people feel free and open to have conversation. Yeah. Well, it's also a sign they probably have committed unfair labor practice. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of companies are finding out the hard way that concerted protected activity yes. isn't necessarily a, a union petition. It's coming together to uh, bring current concerns, right? right to attention management. So we, we are seeing on the management side the need for a lot of education, frankly, on the potential for retaliation yeah. uh, using online uh, petitions. Yeah. It's, it's only going to expand. Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, check in to see if there are questions. We do have some room monitors that have roving microphones. In Thank you. Um, my question is, with bargaining on the union or employer side, it traditionally is a small group of people, and I will be honest, it excludes a lot of people of certain education, demographic, nationality, what have you. And um, I work with 28 unions where having some online communication sort of broadens the feedback and the voices that you get. So my question to you, is that something you've considered when you're looking at how you're going to plan for the use of social media in your future collective bargaining? Yeah, I think it's a good question, definitely. I think there, I mean, I, I would say in, in a couple of things, obviously it has important ramifications for 
race, class, sex, and those are things we all have to pay attention to in the labor movement. It also has to do with, you know, maybe loosening up uh, the, the process a little bit. We get comfortable with just the same old people showing up every three years and lose touch with our bargaining units as a result. So both things, I think, are true. So the, this morning session, that issue came up in another way. Should there be more younger workers at the bargaining table on behalf of both management and union side? Now, perhaps so, because of those so-called millennial issues, whatever those may be. Uh, we do have a work called seniority, though, that sometimes might interfere with that. But I think the composition of the bargaining team <clears throat> is now going to be more important. And at least on the management side, I know one of the first things that we always look at, well, who's the union bringing to the table? Where do they work? What are their issues? That might influence, maybe, uh, some of our proposals. It might influence how we bargain. So I think all this has a lot of ramifications. Yes. Yeah, I just, partly a comment, partly a question. So, you know, we have unions, right, in today's workforce that largely got codified and institutionalized, you know, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, that's kind of where all the NLRA came from and all of that. Um, so now we have this, we have laws that support collective bargaining. Um, maybe not very effectively, but anyway. Um, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is unions didn't fall out of the sky. I mean, the unions came first, the law came later, okay? So this whole notion that IBM is going to represent the workers in all cases and their interests, this is something you touched on, Lowell, to me smacks of what I'll call company unionism, right? This is a company union that they're trying to put together. So if, when they, when, and it, it may work fine, and as you said, you know, they, it, it, it's allowed them to address some issues, but there's gonna come a point in time when, and you've, you mentioned it, where IBM is not gonna wanna d make the change that the workers want changed, and then what, okay? So this system that IBM has set up, it's called Pulse, is that what you call mm -hmm. it, Pulse? Okay, so, so then at that point, um, can Pulse, um, divorce itself, or can those workers take over Pulse and turn it into um, a union? I mean, I think, you know, otherwise, if IBM controls it, it's not really representing the workers' interests. So this goes back to something you said, Lowell, about, you know, we've got your back. Um, and so my question is, like, where is that line? I mean, it, you know, where is that line at specifically at IBM, but even with, um, um, even with your organization, Michelle, you know, where is that line? When does it become the workers' union with the right, with, you know, the ability to strike, the ability to actually exert real power and have control of that organization? I, I actually think, I, I'm just going to jump here. I actually think that's one of the reasons why we had this panel. There are, are so many questions as the pace of change move so quickly. It's like that scene from, I don't know if you remember Jurassic Park, the original one, when they talked about the, the eggs and we don't have to worry about them reproducing because we're just going to withhold you know, the, the, what they need. And uh, the, um, uh, Jeff Goldblum said, life will find a way. And so here we have all of these changes that are happening and we, I think, are watching history unfold before us as life finds a way. I don't know what all of you think about that. Well. But I think any employer that thinks it can get involved in employee engagement to such a degree and not listen to their workers uh, has serious problems. That, that would be my first point. That's just totally wrong. But, but, but second, there are some employers, I'm sure, that would fit into that category. And I've often told uh, clients that I've represented, you can go down the path of creating all these advisory committees and things that you wish. If you don't listen and don't do the right thing, uh, you're going to have repercussions. They're going to be negative. <clears throat> and those negativity responses could be online petitions, bad publicity. Uh, it could be an organizational campaign from Union X, Y, or Z. And it could be a violation of the National Labor Relations Act because you've created, per your question, uh, a bona fide labor organization, at least under the NLRA. And you're going to have to deal with that. So, employers that think they can just skate by by creating employee engagement. And, and IBM, I know, is serious about that. They're one of our 
excellent members, and you really do take your associates' thoughts to heart. But if you think you can just skate by uh, with this uh, artificial employee engagement and uh, try to snow the employees, I think you lose. I don't know, that's my thought. I mean, we, we're not a big union, but our biggest department is the organizing department, and our director of organizing, Ray Mark, you've heard him say this. I mean, he, he loves metrics. Every organizer has to have a certain number of house visits. House visits, you know, face to face. They have a certain number of emails. They really do. They actually do house visits. It's apartment visits a lot, but you know. But the thing he says, the, the key factor he uses in evaluating whether an organizer is going to stick around is the ability to translate a thought into an action. Mm -hmm. And an organizer who can't do that, who can't take the feedback, the ideas, the complaints, and turn it into, okay, now what action are you going to take, is not, not going to stick around. So that is sort of where, at that point, maybe that's where the union comes in, where people are motivated to actually take action. And that's our job. I'll just um, very briefly say, um, IBM is union agnostic. Um, our, our employee, our workforce is actually unionized in some, um, in many countries actually. So, um, but to, to answer some of your questions, I'll, I'll just point back to what Duan said. I don't know. Um, you know, these types of, uh, uh, the, the law is still evolving, I would say, right? Um, I don't think there's a clear-cut answer yet, so. So I know, I know one of the questions we often get in the management side, whether it be Fight for 15, Michelle, or these other petition movements, so what's the end game here? Is there really any benefit for organized labor? Uh, do they increase their market share uh, by these uh, petition approaches, the social movement approaches, Fight for 15, what have you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we were founded on the question of uh, what do these kinds of decentralized networks actually become and are really questioning and, and um, our support of workers forming these kinds of networks, you know, are they asserting new forms of labor organization? Right. Um, and we, you know, we don't, we sincerely don't know the answer. We, what we believe, our hypothesis is that by watching the ways in which workers form these networks um, and start to engage in new forms of negotiation and start to um, attempt to leverage power in new ways and in old ways, I mean, I think eventually there might be a strike by a network, maybe. I don't know. I'm not predicting it. At, um, at that point, there are labor organizations, I think. I, I, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> you are trying to get me in trouble. No, I'm, I'm not. No, no, no. <laughs> accepting the bait. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> but I, I um, yeah, I mean, I think that what we're going to start to see is that, that as they experiment with new forms of power and leverage, the signals of what um, evolving labor organizations are going to look mm -hmm. like outside of what the NLRA determined um, and, you know, in the 1930s. And I, those are really exciting mm -hmm. moments to me um, and that they might inform our next sets of policies and that we really are, uh, we see ourselves as a nurturing space for people starting to identify what that is. Who had the next question? Yeah, just um, kind of a comment and a question on, especially with younger people. One, do you think you can actually get them to strike? Because I don't think that's, as, it depends on the pay, of the pay levels. Yeah. The other thing, and I teach school, and I don't have a problem charging them 300 bucks for a law book. The law students will pay it, but if you go to a graduate school, they, $20, that's about the max. They really expect information to be free. Mm. And these types of uh, boards and that you guys are doing, Michelle, do they pay for that? I think for organized labor, that'll be one of the real challenges is converting the action of, we really want to help the company to a strike and we're willing to pay for representation out of our paycheck to do that. Just some comments on that. Yeah. I think that's a very, yeah, that's a great observation and comment. And we, so for transparency, because people always want to know, it's like, how are we funded? We're mostly funded by um, foundation support and fellowships and some uh, fee-for-service partnerships. Um, so workers don't pay to use the platform. 
Um, part of the reason that workers don't pay to use the platform is that it, we, it is very new and they have, or they are experimenting themselves and when we talk about trust, um, are really still in a process of building trusted networks over time uh, and it would be, I think, um, foolish to expect somebody who to be really clear, has maybe signed a few petitions and engaged in online conversations to think about themselves as part of something that is as formalized as an actual union. Um, and I think we'll get there, we'll uh, get to some sort of sense of a membership of a network, but we're not there yet, and so it wouldn't, it just wouldn't make sense um, for people to be contributing. But eventually, I do believe, especially in the context of uh, the fishering workplace and the fact that, um, uh, benefits um, and security are rapidly being divorced by, from employment, that there is a potential for people to really see these networks as mutual aid networks, for, to use a classic term, um, where you are um, contributing in some way to some sort of um, shared security model um, that you can tap back into if you need it. Um, and I think that if you look at it from that perspective, there is the possibility that people would eventually contribute. I don't think it's going to be a ton of money, but um, actually our experience um, in other contexts is that people are, even people who don't have a lot of money, are willing to pay some amount um, when they see value from the organization. I would add to your list of questions about strike strength, uh, whether it's a high turnover freelance workforce. Mm -hmm. It's a much bigger challenge there. Uh, these digital shops I was talking about are, believe it or not, pretty stable. I mean, as stable as one's employment record is when one is 28. You know, these are places where people expect to work longer, and that <coughs> increases the ability to do that. Okay. One last question. Who has so, the... For, for Roger and Lowell, uh, if you could talk some about um, thinking about the practicality and logistics of uh, a collective bargaining situation. Um, when you have multiple parties coming in, multiple members coming in and out, or uh, the transparency so that anyone can talk anytime they want, how do you con ever get a tentative agreement? Uh, what kind of uh, ground rules do you think would work? I think that's exceedingly uh, difficult to do. I mean, you, you, in your questioning, identify a lot of just practicality elements. That, that degree of trust across the table is so important. I know when I would negotiate a contract, can I rely upon what that person is telling me? And does that person really have the support of the, the bargaining unit? If, if we have ever changing landscapes, I don't know how I establish that relationship, or at least I don't have an ability to gauge really where the union is, what is their real need to get a deal? Uh, not, not not, not the real, not their wants. I want to know what their needs are and what can bring us together for a deal. With, with those changing variabilities and with people coming online in and out, uh, I don't know. I think those are all very practical obstacles. Oh, I totally agree. I, we, maintaining a stable and engaged bargaining committee is critical and rotating members in and out is just not going to work and we've mm -hmm. never tried that. I would say that the, the additional dimension that this electronic communications revolution has made is that there are more people feeding things into the committee and the committee is able to feed things back out and engage the, their shops more directly. But having a fluctuating group of people who just happen to have you know a couple hours that afternoon and come in with their pet peeve, boy, that's a recipe for disaster, definitely. And, and on the other hand, I will say one thing we've experimented with is having more sort of testimonials by, yeah. by bargaining unit committee members. Like, well, the reason we made this proposal on editorial independence is this, that, the other thing. And, and uh, it's actually gratifying to hear this, Roger, because this has been our experience yeah. too. When a manager is sitting across from an employee of the company who is saying, this has happened to me, it isn't just Peterson, you know, it, it has a more oomph. Mm. Uh, within, uh, as provided it doesn't go to this extreme of anybody comes in and says whatever comes off the top of their head, because that's not, that's not persuasive, that's just random. Yeah. Okay. I would agree, at the table when we had valid presentations from an employee uh, that were representative, I mean, we listened to that. I, I, I'm just really concerned uh, about this era of so many uh, proposals coming in, how you sift through those and how you deal with them. Smart. And I'm, I'm, I'm also concerned about uh, the ground rules here. As we said in the slide, right now under the LRA, you can't go to impasse in this area of 
uh, stenography or recordings, if you will. I'm not sure that law or that case law might not change. But I mean, this is going to be a tremendous challenge for both unions and management, how we deal with this. All right. Well, we are at the end of our hour and a half. I want to thank these wonderful panelists for sharing their experiences uh, with you. Okay. Thank you very much.